Hello, everybody. Uh, today we're going to talk about mach is machine learning the right tool. Uh, first, a little bit about me. I work as a senior machine learning engineer uh, at a company called United Shore. Uh, so I'm from Michigan, so I could do the whole hand thing. Uh, we're located about 30 minutes outside Detroit. And I like to say we're the other big mortgage company in Metro Detroit. Everybody knows Quicken Loans. We're the, uh, the wholesale side of the industry. Uh, I've been doing professional development for a little over 11 years. Uh, mostly in the Microsoft stack until more recently with uh, some of the machine learning stuff I'm doing. Um, but enough about me. Let's start talking about machine learning. So I always wanted to start off with some terms, and I know we've heard these uh, several times today. Uh, but I just want to give you my definitions and, uh, you know, use that as a basis for things we're going to talk about. The first thing is uh, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is for things that are very difficult um, to program and things that you typically need human humans to look at things like, such as identifying objects, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence, which uses spe specified algorithms to do different tasks within machine learning or within artificial intelligence. And then within machine learning, there's a subset called deep learning. Deep learning is just neural nets. So if you ever hear neural networks or deep learning, just equate those two things as the same. So one of the other things I want to talk about is what is data science? So this is another term that's not really well defined by the industry. And it's one of those things you ask 10 different people, you get 10 different answers. For me, what it is, is it's using data to find patterns and to solve problems that are not easy or possible with other methods. And we'll look more at that as we go along. Um, so the format of this is I broke it down into some myths and we'll talk about things as we go along. But the first of these I want to talk about is that machine learning will allow robots to take over the world because this is where everybody's mind goes the second they hear about artificial intelligence and all the things that we're doing with machine learning. Um, as you start learning machine learning and getting in, in, into this type, of, this type of field, you find that this is a lot, more, a lot further off than you might have ever realized. And I don't think this would even happen necessarily in like our lifetime. So I wouldn't even worry about this, and don't let this be a barrier to entry, like, oh my god, it's scary, because it's going to, you know, we're going to build things, it's going to destroy us. <laughs> the second one is that machine learning will put millions of people out of work. I don't think this is necessarily true. I think that machines augment humans, they don't replace humans. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the work that we do. So we're in the mortgage industry, and some of the, the, the product that we're building is a document recognition engine using machine learning and deep learning. And we actually have teams of people that did this work previously. We're not trying to replace these people. We're never going to get it to 100%, right? What we're trying to do is we're trying to give them the, the ability to have more bandwidth. So, for example, as our company keeps growing, we grew from like 1,500 people uh, to 4,500 people within two years. So it's, we basically want to be able to handle more volume of mortgages without having to keep growing the teams exponentially. So that's what our product is, is attempting to solve. And we're not trying to replace those people. We're just trying to give them the ability to do more work with less time and without uh, the need to scale the, the people wise of it. Uh, myth number three is that machines can learn autonomously. Um, most machine learning algorithms require supervision. Those that don't, AKA supervised learning, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, only help to simplify the problem. And you also have reinforcement learning. Today, this is mostly semi-supervised. Uh, and it's, we're still a little bit of ways off from true reinforcement learning. But uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, more about that later as we go along, too. <laughs> this one I absolutely love because people don't actually say this. But I think a lot of people uh, kind of interpret this in their brain because they don't really understand machine learning. So like, it's magic, it solves all my problems. No, not true at all. Machine learning is a very specific set of algorithms that solve very specific problems in very specific ways. I'll help you guys figure out the types of problems we can solve with it. And as long as you can formulate your problem into those, uh, one of those buckets, then I will show you how we could actually build algorithms and stuff around that. Um, and that's what I just said. So the first thing is we're going to look at is supervised learning. Supervised learning is broken down into two categories. You have classifications and regressions. Classifications are things like 
Is this spam or not? Is, is this email spam or not? Is this picture of a dog? What type of dog is in the picture? Is this part that's coming off the assembly line, is it defective? Regressions, on the other hand, are actually predicting values. These are like, given past sales history, what is our sales likely to be for this current month? Okay, so another simplified example of this is um, like weather, right? So classifications, as I, as I alluded to, there are labels. This would be like sunny, rainy, snowy, uh, cold, uh, etc. Regressions would be, what is the actual temperature going to be today? Is it going to be 85 degrees? Is it going to be 33 degrees? So this is the differentiation between the two things. So I want you to keep that in mind as we, as we start talking about uh, the type of algorithms and things you can do with machine learning. Oh, and if you guys have questions along the way, just raise your hand and let me know. Um, so with the classification, I think everybody understands, you know, the label, you give it a label. But what I wanted to point out is that it doesn't, ha you know, labels can sometimes be hierarchical, right? So you could give it a picture of a toucan, and it could say, okay, well, it's a toucan, which is also a bird, which is also a vertebrate, which is also an animal. So this is one of the things that we actually have to account for in our document classification system, is that when we're classifying a document, sometimes we might need to label it as something different. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, is that it doesn't have to be just a, a flat, you know, uh, one type of classification itself. Uh, so for example, it could be both snowy and raining at the same time, right? Or it could be cold and rainy, rather. So regressions, uh, we'll take a little bit of a look at this. So there's basically two kinds, there's linear and nonlinear. So let's assume, let's assume that the graph on the left is, um, you know, Apple's worth over time, right? Because it's just gone up and up and up. It's never really gone down. So let's just assume that it's a straight line all the way up, right? Well, now let's let's take a look and let's say, okay, well now it's something more realistic. Let's say that, you know, we're a lawn, lawn company and, you know, we're trying to track our sales and what our, what our projections are going to be and how many people do we need to have and things like that. Well, we might be really busy in the spring and summer and we do like no business in the winter, maybe a little bit of snow removal, but that's about it. So your data could be very fluctuating. <laughs> so this is where we get into machine learning, right? Linear regression is statistically interesting, but not really machine learning interesting, right? We could do this, we could, we could figure out this graph using just simple statistics and not have to even get into machine learning. So from a machine learning perspective, we really don't even care about this type of regression. What we care about is the nonlinear stuff, things that are very complicated, very un undulating, and things that are not you know, very intuitive to figure out. Okay, any questions on any of this so far? All right, cool. <laughs> so now we'll talk about unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning comes in two forms as well. The first is clustering, such as what are these data points are most alike? How many labels am I gonna need to, to, you know, to create a classifier? Um, and then the other side is dimensionality reduction. Based upon the data I have, my model's not performing well. What features do I actually need in my model to actually make a really good model? <laughs> so here's an example of clustering. Let's assume that uh, the X is your square footage, the Y is your sales price. And now we're trying to predict what are the ranges of prices that we should have if we're trying to do like a faceted search, right? So everybody knows about going to like Amazon, you have like Let's say you're doing customer reviews. I want to see everything that's a four star or higher, right? So we're trying to do that same type of thing, but ours, in, in our case, is going to be groupings of prices for houses, okay? So we can basically plot out all the data, and then we basically can utilize an algorithm such as k-means in this case, and it can say, yeah, you know, these, these points are the most like, uh, the, most, uh, the most alike, and therefore we need four labels or four different classifications of values and then we could just take the lowest and the highest out of those ranges, and then that would give us our groupings. Okay? Any questions about that before we move on? All right, good. Because this, this, bear with me for a second. This is going to seem really confusing at first, but it, it will make sense, I promise. So on the other hand is dimensionality reduction. So real real data looks very complicated, just like this three-dimensional graph, right? So we, uh, you know, like, 
we as humans can very easily conceptualize things in two dimensions, like a two dimensional image, you know, X and Y coordinates. Once we start adding Z, A, B, C, like well, as we keep adding more and more dimensions, it gets more and more confusing, right? So part of what this is doing is it allows us to take something and flatten it. So in this case, we're taking it from a three dimensional graph into a two dimensional uh, image. And now let's take a look at what this would mean in terms of like an example. So one of the things I want to come up with was like an NLP example. So let's say that we have a data set that is three sentences. I like databases, I dislike databases, and Brian likes databases, okay? We can calculate something called a corpus. Basically it's saying uh, take a unique list of the words, right? So, so select, uh, you know, select group by, uh, you know, or, or the, uh, you know, where you have just the, uh, the word, right? So we can't really work with these sentences in machine learning, right? We have to do something with it to get it to numbers, right? So what we have to do is what they call an encoding. One of the ways you can encode is you can basically take your corpus, and as you see, that becomes our, our you know, our, our uh, columns, just like an Excel spreadsheet. And then for each of that, you basically, so each row represents one of those sentences. So I go through the through the through the sentence and I say I like databases. Well, does Brian appear? No. Databases, how many times does it appear? It appears once. Dislike does not appear, so zero. So we basically figure out and then we get um, you know, a, a matrix of numbers. So if we were to train a model on this, what do you guys think would be one potential problem about having things like like my name in there? It's what? That's true. So there's it basically would boil down to one of two things. Either you would overfit the model because your data is too specific, and you'd have to you'd have to um, have Brian in the sentence in order for it to pick it up, or your data is going to be so sparse that it's not even going to pick it up. Because let's let's assume that it's you know Brian likes databases, uh, you know Sam likes databases, David likes databases. If you have all like a whole list of names now, then now I can't generalize about the sentences, and therefore my data is too sparse to even learn anything from. Okay. So one of the things that we can do is the dimensionality reduction. Let's say we did an analysis, like a principal component analysis or PCA for short, and let's say that it said, "Hey, uh, if we chop off that Brian column because it only appears in like one one out of the ten million documents." then now we save ourselves a ton of computation time and we can actually build a lot more accurate model. So then what we end up with is a simplified version of that same thing. Okay, any questions about this? Hopefully this is easy to follow. Cool. So let's take another, exa let's take another example and uh, I'll show you how the same thing would apply. So let's say that we want to predict the sales price of a house. So we'd start with a uh, data structure. We'd go, pop, we'd go get data from a data set like the Boston Housing data set, for example. We'd populate these fields in, and then we build a model, okay? So let's say that we build a model and it's horrible performance. Let's say it has several problems. One is when we split our data into training and testing sets, we can't even accurately predict the values in our testing set. And the prices seem to be all over the board. Sometimes they're somewhat close, sometimes they're just way off. And we can't even figure out the correlations between why did this house sell for 100,000 more than the one next door? And that type of thing, okay? So I'm gonna show you how we can combat some of that. Um, so again, just like I'd mentioned previously, we could do a principal component analysis. This would help to figure out what things have an impact on the model if, when we create it. So one thing to keep in mind is, uh, maybe I should go back to the spreadsheet for this one, the uh, Excel, Excel example. When you have like uh, the spreadsheet type example, every column in machine learning terms is considered to be equal. This column is not any more important than this column, okay? So if you wanted that column to be more important, you would have to adjust for that when you populate the values in. Right, this is the reason why you normalize data typically between like zero and one or negative one and positive one. And then you would do that same type of normalization across the board. 
Okay. Any questions about that? Cool. All right. So, in terms of this, let's say that we did that, and the results were that if we drop off sales date and street address, uh, because those are really skewing our data and giving us bad predictions, then we actually get a lot better model. Let's say that we go from like 10% accurate to like 90% accurate. So one of the things to keep in mind, because the first thing you're, you're going to think about is you have to be careful not to apply human bias into your modeling or feature extraction. So the first thing that would go into your head is, oh, sales date, that seems important, right? That seems important to figure out, you know, if this house sold 20 years ago, that would be a, that would be a correlation as to why this house is more expensive than the one that sold 20 years ago, right? <laughs> but what if I told you that the sales, the sales date is irrelevant because the sales price is converted into the same 2019 dollars, right? So if this house sold in 1980 and this house sold in 2019, we convert the money to both be 2019 and now we can compare the two values, right? We can't compare money from, you know, 30 years ago to money of today and we got to put them in the same terms. That's, that's the point of the normalization. Once you have the money in the same terms, now you can actually compare them and you can, you can figure out what the correlations are between them. That's why sales data in this case is not relevant. And that's why you have to be careful of this. Because if you're not careful of applying your bias or your opinion on the data, you could actually, uh, you know, make the data, make the models even worse. So you might ask yourself, well, what are the problems with keeping these features? Well, in this example, as we saw, they could negatively affect the model, thus causing bad predictions. Why? Because we assume that every column is equal, and if every column is equal, then we have no idea what it's going to fixate on. This also would lead to longer training times because there's a lot of wasted computation. And probably the most important is that it's going to lead to bloated models. What I mean by bloated models is it might take your model from, let's say it's uh, 50 kilobytes to like 100 meg or more, and now you have a lot of stuff you're loading in memory and all that cal calculations it has to do during, uh, you know, during production time. Okay, do you guys see why that's bad? Okay, any questions about this before, before I move on? All right, cool. Uh, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is recommendation engines. Um, I don't think anybody needs uh, really in-depth examples of this. I think everybody sees this, uh, and, and as the previous, uh, the previous speaker alluded to, you know, things like Netflix and Amazon, uh, where, you know, you like this, you might also like that. Um, I consider these to be their own uh, classification of machine learning. The reason why is because I think the intention is different than supervised learning. I think, or unsupervised learning, rather. With unsupervised learning, it's basically I'm trying to do some analysis against some data points that I really don't know anything about, where I think recommendations is kind of taking that concept, but it's also correlating it with things like in your database, right? You know, like what did customers buy? What are, what are people liking? Things like that. So you're actually kind of augmenting the two things together. And I think it's, an, it's uh, the, that's, that's where the difference comes into play. <laughs> uh, and the last type is reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning you see with like self-driving cars. Uh, there's also such things as like continual learning, uh, where basically you're taking new data from uh, you're taking new data from from prediction time, and then uh, you're actually continually learning on it. You're basically adjusting your model without having to rebuild everything all over again. Um, and then you can also do things like learning based upon user input, and that would be like where you'd have like an application. Where like maybe you're searching for emails or something, you you, you click on something that's you know that, that you're uh, of interest, and it might say, oh well, you might also look at these, uh, that type of thing. Okay, so myth number five. Sorry, myth number four was kind of big. Um, myth number five is that you only need to learn one machine learning algorithm. Um, not true at all. And I'm not going to really show you how to read this because I, the, the previous speaker just went through all this. Um, but basically, like, this is an example of, uh, you know, the Azure cheat sheet. And basically, you figure out what type of algorithm you're trying to solve, and then that tells you what types of things you should look at, right? So if I'm trying to do classification with three labels, then I should look at, you know, these examples here. And then that's where I start looking at to figure out how am I going to solve the problem I'm trying to solve. 
Okay. Uh, algorithms are more important than your data. This one, because one of the things I think is kind of a misconception is when you take like a Coursera course or, or things like that, I think they focus only on what everybody calls the fun part, right? They give you a nice set, of nice training data. It's nicely normalized. Here's here to use this algorithm, right? They don't they don't teach you a lot of the differences between it. So algorithm selection could is, is very important for things like accuracy and performance. However, data is what we actually learn from. If you don't know your data and you don't set your data up properly, bad data equals bad predictions regardless. No algorithm is going to substitute that for you. Therefore, you have to know your data and you have to set up your problem accordingly. Otherwise, you're not going to be very successful. And this is not only true if you're going to homebrew your entire solution, but even if you're using a data service that's, uh, you know, even like some of the stuff with Azure Cognitive Services, if you don't know your, if you, if you have a lot of conflicting data and it's in, you know, um, not organized and things like that, you can, it can, the model can get very confused and actually can misclassify a lot of things. Most algorithms, and this is the other thing to keep in mind, most algorithms will give you the same answers. It's just that some might be a little bit more accurate or some might be a little bit more performant. So I tried to think of an analogy of how to describe this the best. And the only thing that really came to mind was sorting algorithms. So uh, who remembers like sorting algorithms from like college? Anybody have to do that stuff in college? So this, you know, so, so basically you have several different, so for those of you guys that aren't familiar with the problem, basically you have several different types of sorting methods and they all have trade-offs that you have to make. And you have to figure out which one is the most performant for what you're trying to do. So this is a cheat sheet to show you the, the algorithmic and time, the time and space complexity of the algorithm. And if you're like me and I always forget what, like, what is n log n and all that, this is kind of a cheat sheet. So obviously you'd want to pick stuff that's, you know, the lowest, that's green, right? So I, I think it's a fair assumption that most people here are, are C-sharp. C sharp devs, right? Does anybody know if you say like I, I have an I enumerable and I say dot sort, does anybody know what sorting algorithm it uses? What was that? Nope. I'm sorry. What was the question? Oh, I said it. So if you're so if you're in C sharp and you have like an I enumerable of T, and I say dot sort, or like I have a list and I say dot sort, what algorithm does it pick? What one? No. Uh, do you say quick? Yeah, yeah. So it actually uses quick sort, right? So if you look in the best, in the average case, it's, it's the same, which is, you know, generally the best, right? However, this is an example of why you can't have one machine learning algorithm. Why? Because if, you're, if you know that your data is in reverse, if your data is already reverse sorted, then you will always be in the worst case scenario for quicksort. Reverse sorted data is the absolute worst scenario for quicksort. So if you know that your data is going to be like that, then you probably don't want to use the built-in quicksort algorithm. Right? So do you, do you see how there's like trade-offs and why you would pick one over another, why there's not just one algorithm to rule them all? Okay. So bring it back to machine learning terms. One of the things you're going to find, and the reason why I bring this point up, is because when I started off on this problem, I was basically given the task of, here, you need to figure out how to classify these documents. So, like any good developer, go to uh, Mr. Google and start Googling it. And everybody seems to have their own opinion. And I was like, no, 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 don't do that, do this. No, 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 don't do that, do this. Basically, pick one and start with it. So. This is the type of graph you'll see, uh, take it from a research paper, where they compare different types of methods for solving document classification using text. And I can tell you that um, this is, even in this case, like their testing is, is uh, probably not the best because like, I'm actually using the bag of words with a logistic regression and we're hitting 98% accuracy in production. Doing millions and millions of requests per month. So that goes to the point of just pick one, start with it, try it out, and spend your time on your data. 
You have to spend your time on your data. Um, so here's some funny examples uh, you guys might you might as might like. Um, this one is called blueberry muffin or chihuahua, and this is an example of where if your data is not properly labeled, you, you need to spend time making sure that the data is correct, because if you if you misclassify one of these, then the machine learning is going to pick you know it's going to fixate on that, and it might pick out like oh well that one said it was a muffin, so therefore every muffin is now a chihuahua or something. This one's equally as funny, but even I think it even exacerbates the problem because some of these you really can't tell. If you look at some of the ones on the bottom row, you really can't tell at all, you know, which ones are, uh, you know, which ones are. So this is why it's important to have good data. It's important to know exactly what your data is. And if you have data like this one where you don't know what it is, don't put it in your data set. If you don't know that that data is correct, you're better off to have less data that you know is correct than you are to have more data. Okay? This one, I think, conveys a very good point. This is an intentionally screwed up data set called Husky or Wolf, right? So if, you know, as humans, how, do we, how would we dis distinguish between them, right? If we would look at Huskies, you know, I might say more pointy ears, uh, has black around the face, you know, we might figure, you know, point out uh, certain characteristics of the dog. Well, in this bottom example, what do you think it's going to pick? Do you think that's going to be a husky or a dog? What was it? Husky? Nope. Yep. So the answer is actually wolf. Does anybody know why it's wolf? Exactly. It's in snow, not in grass. So all the pictures of the husky are in grass. All the pictures of the wolf are in snow. Therefore, it fixated on the snow instead of the actual animal, which conveys the point of you can't, you have to know your data, make sure things are representative, things are set up correctly. Otherwise, what you think it's going to fixate on is not what it fixates on. This is why a lot of people get into trouble doing machine learning, where they try to do like facial recognition and things like that because their data set is not representative of it. And even going back to the example in, the, in your talk about, you know, less than 50%, what ends up happening, and the reason why you get that bias, is because you have to turn quant qualitative data into quantitative data, right? So you have quantit or qualitative data, like male or female, and you have to turn that into a number. So what's the most logical thing? One of them is one, one of them is zero, right? And when you do that, what ends up happening is that you're now biasing one way versus the other. And one of the ways you can combat that is you could do what I call bias balancing. Basically, you could have the same, you basically would have that as a, as a feature twice, once one way, once the other way, and that way they're equal, and that way it has a better chance to learn the difference instead of saying, oh, well, you picked uh, males as one, therefore, if you're male, you qualify, and if you're not, then you don't. That's why a lot of people get into trouble with, with a lot of the machine learning stuff. Uh, any questions about this or anything so far? Yeah. What a... um, so if you go back to like my example where I did the text, where I broke it down into words, think of it as, as let's, uh, in terms of like a spreadsheet, just think of it as adding another column uh, with the opposite value. So let's say, for example, you'd have one column that said gender, and then let's say you'd males are one and females are zero, then you'd have the same column and you'd have that flipped. And that way it can learn, because those two columns are now equal, so it's not fixating on one, uh, you know, you have a better chance of that not being so biased. Um, this is the other, this is another big one that people get misconstrued by is that 90% of the machine learning project is truly machine learning and data science, the fun stuff, as everybody calls it. It's really not. This is another uh, diagram I stole from Azure. Azure makes the best diagrams. I love them. Thank you. Um, so in this case, this is, this is basically the life cycle of a machine learning project. You first have to define a problem, collect the data, you prepare the data, you develop a model, train the model, analyze, and then publish, and then monitor, and then that whole cycle repeats. Put another way, 
The boxes in green are machine learning. Everything else is programming. This is where I make a distinction between programming problems and machine learning problems. Right? Anybody knows how to query a database. Anybody knows how to get the data out of it. But the building the model and things are requires specialized knowledge and, and being able to evaluate that modeling. Right? And then, then once you have that model, then you know, building the code and publishing, like that's all back to programming again. So this is where I make the distinction between it. And all these all these steps are, are important and have to be done in order for this to be a workable solution. Why? Because a machine learning model or machine learning application doesn't exist on its own. It's always part of another system, unless it's going to be like a service. But even that service is still part of another system that you're just utilizing, right? Even to do like Lewis and stuff, like you're still building it in as part of another system, right? So this is another big one, and it says that machine learning and data science is all new. Well, I got news for you, it's not. So these are when the terms actually came into, uh, into record, I guess, when they were coined, if you will. Um, so artificial intelligence has been around in one way, shape, or form since like 1300. Uh, more modern definitions put it around 1960s. Uh, the, the term neural network and what a neural network is, 1943. This actually was uh, developed by a mathematician uh, based upon a lot of the work from the uh, the Church Turing thesis, uh, and that's actually where a lot of that that actually comes from. So any of you guys that are familiar with Alan Turing, um, it's a lot of it's based on his work. Uh, machine learning, 1959. Data science, 1960. So even looking at data science, how does a term that's like 50 years old, almost 60 years old, how does it not have a clear definition? Like, isn't that weird? So the, the biggest question then becomes, why do we care all of a sudden? Why is this thing everywhere? Why, does, why is AI even a big thing right now? Does anybody know? Yep. We now have the resources to turn what was theoretical into practical. And now, with the, the invention of the GP, GPU around, I want to say, like 2011, 2012, it actually get with the, the concept of being able to offload all this work onto the GPU, it actually caused or it actually allowed us to actually take what was theoretical, mathematical on paper and actually build workable software with it. I'm sorry? The data was another big issue, yes. We didn't have the data. Yep. And we're actually yeah, th that's a very good point. I know I guess I didn't even think about that. Is that we're producing more data now than we ever have before which I think is creating an even bigger need for it than there ever was before. This one I want to spend a little bit of time on, and it says that tasks are always performed in real time. And this can depend on a lot of factors, um, to, to, depending on what your thing uh, is doing, you know, the type of problem you're trying to solve, the amount of data, uh, normalization, algorithms you're picking, et cetera, et cetera. Because as we saw with the sorting algorithms, not all algorithms are the same, right? They're not all, they don't all run at the same amount of time and things like that. So an example that I wanna break, I wanna show you guys, because I think it's a very common machine learning thing out there. And um, I wanna show you kind of how it works. And that is image classification. So let's say for example, we have several labels, cat, dog, a hat, and a mug. Well, we as humans see the cat Computers don't understand pixels and things like that, right? So we have to find a way to turn pixels basically into numbers that we can now do mathematical operations on to actually figure out, like, what does a cat look like? What to find, like, math, like number-wise, what, what does a cat look like? So we do this by a process known as convolution. Um, so basically what it is is you take the image, and as this little box shows, you basically break it into these chunks, um, by applying what they call a mathematic or uh, uh, a kernel. So this basically says, let's say your pixels are one, 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 zero, one, one, blah, blah, blah. You, you take like one times this value, add it to zero times that value, add it to that. And it basically what you do, what you end up with, is you take the value of this and you plug it into that box. Um, and by doing that, what you end up with is if you notice here, 
by, by, by applying that convolution, you actually take it from a five by five chunk down to a three by three. So this is a process known as downsampling, where you're actually condensing the data. Who here is familiar with how MD5 hashing or how the concept of how hashing would work? Anybody? Okay. So basically what it is is like, let's say you want, you want to compare two, let me do a quick, real quick. So let's say you want to compare two files. And what hashing is, is you take a two file, you know, data that's a variable length. Think of it as like a Word doc. It could be one page, it could be 10 pages, it could be five pages. Well, if, if one document is 10 pages and one document is two pages, how do you compare the two? So basically it is a way of converting from a variable, variable sized thing into a fixed size thing by creating this string, this magic string called a hash. And then basically it's deterministic so that every time you, ha you give it the same data, it gives you back the same value. Okay, so, so it's the same concept, and uh, sorry, that was probably even more confusing because uh, most people aren't familiar with it. Um, but basically, this is a visual of how that works. So if you look here, we're taking an image, and then we break it down at all those small chunks by doing that convolution. And now that we have a value there, we just add the value all the way back, right? So if we have a one in the box there, we take the one plus one plus one, and then that, can, that condenses it down even further. All right? And then as you can see, that, that whole process just repeats all the way down. But the biggest thing to note here is notice how the image is reducing in size each time. So see how it goes from, you know, an, uh, let's say that was a large image to a smaller image to a very small, 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 small. See how it's condensing and condensing and condensing the data all the way down. And then at the very end, you just have a neural net that uh, just, you know, produces your prediction. It's, it's, not really re it's not really removed. It's basically built into the next set of numbers, right? So I have to, so if I add, so let's say that I have these layers here, and let's say that I have, a, you know, the first pixel, or the first box, if you will. Let's say it was one, one, and one. So basically, I take it from these three layers, I'd add the three together, give me a three, and then that three goes into the next layer. So I'm, I'm reducing the data, but I'm not removing data. So let me show you what a real one of these would look like. And this is intentionally hard to read. Uh, well, not, well, not intentionally by me, but it's just, it's so large. This is actually uh, something called a Google Net. And this is the type of algorithm that services like uh, the Azure Cognitive Services for the Custom Vision API. This is actually the type of algorithm that they're using. And all of those things that we just talked about, those convolving layers, that's what all these blue boxes represent. That, that flattening it down that we just talked about, that's all these red boxes. And then uh, the, the green ones are just like certain mathematical operations you do along the way. But what I want to convey with this is let's say that you're doing uh, just an image classification. And let's say that this is part of a, let's say you're trying to process a video, right? So if you think about a video, a video is what? Just a series of images where you have 30 images per second, right? And then every second it just keeps repeating, right? You know, the, so it's another 30, another 30, another 30, another 30. Well, this would actually take about 91 milliseconds to run. So if you give it one image, it takes 91 milliseconds to process that one frame of image, which would give you about 11 frames a second. Does anybody know what a standard video, uh, video frame rate is? What is it? It's, yeah, it's about 30. Uh, 60 is becoming more common, but 30 is still the standard. Uh, so, like, film in a movie theater, uh, that is about 24 frames a second. Uh, video that you would shoot on, like, a camcorder, that's about 30 frames a second. So what that means in terms of real time is if we're processing a 30 second or 30 frame per second video, that means we have to produce our calculation in under 33 milliseconds in order for that to process in real time. Right, so, so as you can see from this example, that Google Net is very large and it has a lot of computation that goes into it, and it's almost three times slower than real time. So let me give you another example of this. So back in our document classification stuff that we're doing at work, um, you know, sometimes we have to OCR an image. Uh, sometimes we have to, you know, strip the text out of a PDF. 
sometimes we might have to, uh, you know, take scans or, you know, there, there might be other processors. Maybe we've got to scan the barcode that there's barcodes. And now all those decisions and things have to be done before it even gets to our neural net, right? So it's not just our neural net. Like I said, machine learning doesn't normally exist on its own. It's usually part of a system. That's why that stuff doesn't necessarily perform in real time, right? Another example, too, is if you think about this. If I had to do this, this process to do one image and I have 10,000 images, there's no way that that's going to be in real time. Okay, so is this, is this confusing or does this kind of make sense? Yeah. Is, it, is what decreasing? Well, this isn't, so this is Google Net. This is not Google. Okay, so this is this, so this is what they call um, like a network topology. So, so think of it like a physical network. You know, I have these servers, these 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 machines that are connected, right? So, but but it, but instead, it's actually the nodes of your neural net. So this is a way of solving image classification. This is not what Google is using. I just want to be clear about that. This is not what Google is using. What Google is using is actually instead of being 26 layers, is actually 152, which would make this even tinier. Um, it's not real time. It's probably, I, I haven't measured it with Google, but I know with the Cognit of the Custom Vision API, uh, it was the round trip was almost 200 milliseconds. But I think some of that is you're paying is the cost of actually making an API call coming back. So some of the work that I'm actually doing is in autonomous vehicles. So as you can tell, when I'm trying to make real time predictions, like I can't run up to the cloud. I don't have the luxury of running up to Azure or something. I have to do it on, on the edge uh, and, and do it a lot faster than, so it's basically picking the right algorithm to solve the problem, to make sure I'm accurate enough, but still fast enough. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, this one's an important one, and I, I know we briefly talked about this throughout the talk. But I, I do want to make, I'm going to bring it more to the forefront, is that machine learning is not absent of human bias. So remember what I said when I said every, when you have features, every feature is considered to be equal. So basically, if you think about it, like the shortest path problem, where like maybe you have to travel from city to city, you want to find the shortest path. That's basically what machine learning is going to do mathematically. So if the shortest path is to say, oh, well, if male, then greater than 50% then it's going to do that. that. So basically, think of machine learning as like a rules engine, but instead of you programming the rules, you're letting it figure out the rules by doing pattern recognition based upon samples that you've given it, right? So the thing is, is like I said, it's not, you don't necessarily get to specify what it focuses on. It's going to, you know, it's going to be out of the data. So uh, as I alluded to, machine learning learns only based upon the data you give it. Um, and if the data is biased, the predictions would be biased. But the, what's even worse with that is machine learning will fixate so much on that bias that it will exacerbate it. So, for example, let's say you're building a facial recognition system, and you base it, you know, let's say, you know, let's say you have 100 images, and 80 of them are male, and like 20 of them are female. It's going to learn the difference between male and female. It's going to fixate on that, and then it's, it's going to exacerbate that all the way up. So basically, any time, um, you know, so now let's say you built an application with it. If you're male, it would automatically work, but if you're female, it wouldn't work, right? That's one of the things you have to be careful of. And it's one of the things you have to take into consideration with that. Um, I'm sorry. I think it all depends on the type of problem you're solving and, the, and what your data looks like. So what, what we could talk about, let's, let me talk about this and we'll talk about, we'll, we'll lay the, relay that back. All right, so one of the examples you guys might have heard about in recent years, uh, probably like, I think it's maybe a year or two old now. Um, Amazon's like, hey, you know, we know machine learning. Let's, let's just build a, a resume thing that if somebody submits a resume, we'll determine if they're a good fit for our company. Well, does anybody know what happened with that? 
If you were female, it automatically rejected you. So let's talk a little bit about that. So why do we think that is? Uh, it, so it did have females in it, but it was very disproportionate. So it didn't have enough female data uh, to, to, to learn the difference between the two. Uh, so that was one of the problems. One of the other things too is even if you're looking at resume, and let's say that you stripped out things like name, uh, whatever other um, defining characteristic of the, let's say, gender would be, one of the problems you would still have is if you took like a female resume and labeled it as female and you took a male resume and labeled it as male, sometimes there's a difference between the ways males and females will write. So women in general tend to be more caring, more engaging, more it's us, 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 men are more like I did this, I did this, I know this, blah, blah, blah. You know, it, so it's very different. So kind of the, one of the ways you can solve that is you would take the same resume, you'd put, put it once as female, once as male, and then by doing that, it removes gender from the equation. The other thing you can do is you should have equal number of males and females, right? So like, this kind of goes to the point of, it's not always about just having more and more and more data. Sometimes it's the quality of the data, making sure it's proportionate. Because let's say, for example, we're trying to figure out, uh, you know, if a, if a request or whatever was a good experience for the customer or not. Well, if 99% of your data is all good, then it can't learn the difference between what's good and what's bad, right? So you want to bring it down to an even playing field so that that way it can actually learn the difference between the two things. Make sense? Yeah. It, it is normalizing. Yes, it is normal. Yeah, basically that's exactly what I'm saying. What do you mean by disregard it? D it depends on what you're doing. Like if in the case of resumes, there could be a difference in the way the, the wording that women use versus the word wording that men use. And that's why I say you got to take the same resume and remove gender out of the equation. The way you do that is you take the same resume and say this is a male, and then you take the same one and say this is a female. And then that way, it, it would basically mathematically, so think of it like, anybody know like uh, how acoustics works? Where you have like a positive signal and you have a negative, and if uh, the, the they're the same, then it basically cancels out the sound. It's it's the mathematical equivalent of doing exactly that. Any other questions about this? Yeah. I think that was correct. Yeah, I believe that is. Yes. Yeah, because that yeah that would be that would be exactly that that would be an exact uh, example of where I say where it fixates on a bias and then exacerbates it. So if it could, let's say that it did learn the difference between male and female, it said, "Oh, you're female," it automatically just disregards you. So it basically takes what what's let's say one percent of the data and now applies it to one hundred percent of the predictions that are that are of that that uh, gender. I, th I want to say that names were removed. I, I, I don't know all the details, to be honest with you. Um, I, I'd have to look some of that up. Yeah. Um, this is another big one. And, I, I, as, you know, being software developers, I think it just kind of makes sense. Uh, if, I, if I develop a model once, I don't have to touch it for years to come. What happens to software when you write it and you don't touch it? software rocks, it becomes obsolete, no longer works, blah, 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 just, you know, business requirements change and all the other stuff. So the same things that apply in programming kind of apply in machine learning as well. And you have to keep your models up to date, otherwise your, produ your predictions will be out of date, right? So, so in our case where we have documents, that doesn't mean we need to retrain all of our document models, but like, for example, where we have models on like predicting, um, you know, is this uh, a tax return? that we need to have that every year because that form is gonna change every year. There's gonna be new fields, they're gonna rearrange things, blah, blah, blah. Um, so that same thing applies when we're talking about machine learning. Uh, and just like I said, situations are always changing, some models have to change. So the last two things we're gonna talk about here and then I'll open it up for questions. 
Um, these are kind of half myths. And the reason why I say that is there is some truth to it, but you can't take it as an absolute. And this one says the more data that I have, the better the model I can create. Well, more data is good as long as the data is known to be different and known to be correct. Otherwise, it's probably going to do you more harm than good. And having 20 copies of the same thing doesn't impact the algorithm like you might think it is. And I can show you here, and I, pardon me, I'm going to get into a little bit of math, but it's nothing complicated, I swear. So basically, let's say that, you know, going back to the, the uh, natural language processing example where we had the, the, you know, the columns with the frequencies of the words. Let's assume that this was the, the matrix that came out of that. What's one of the things you notice about this is that the first row and the last row are exactly the same. Basically, it's the same exact string. So if I do a matrix operation which says, you know, row one minus row three and put the result into row three, well, one minus one is zero, two minus two, zero, three minus three, zero. So what do I end up with at the end one? Zero, zero, zero. So A, there's nothing for me to learn, and B, now I'm just wasting computation time. Okay? So another example I want to I want to talk about with that is it might be somewhat controversial, but I'm okay with it. Is that we've been very very successful classifying standardized forms of documents having only five or ten samples, right? We don't necessarily need hundreds of thousands, right? If I can get 98% accurate on that form using only a dozen samples. Why do I need 10 million? The only thing I'm doing is wasting time now. Now that's data I need to make sure is correct. That's data that I need to make sure is in my database. That's, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? The only thing I'm doing is basically wasting time. Uh, so the, basically the way I would do it is, is kind of the way that we built this, or the way I built the system originally. Start with small known things and take what take what data you have or what little data you know like maybe gather only like 200 samples start with like 200 samples if you can find it right um and see how it performs so if you if you're hitting like 98 percent or whatever then then maybe go pull another thousand and then run those thousand through that if it's if that result still holds up then you're good if not then you're like okay there's obviously some variance it's you know we got some labels for our documents that is going to have millions of varieties. So there's going to be a bajillion different models, and we're going to need a ton of data to, to fully classify those. But that doesn't mean that we need a ton of data for every one of our models. Okay? Any other questions about that? Cool. Yes, exactly. So uh, that actually brings up a really good point. One of the things you can do when you don't have it, let's go, let's use his example of the husky versus dogs. Let's say that we don't have any pictures of huskies in snow or wolves in grass. Some of the things you can do is you can augment data. Um, so you can actually like run it through algorithms that will actually manipulate the data. So in the case of documents, it could add noise, it could flip it, it could skew it, it could, you know, do all kinds of things to it and then make sure that the algorithm still holds up. So augment some data. That would give you a lot of bi a bigger data set to, to train or to learn for or to uh, not train but from or to validate from, and then that would prove that your algorithm works uh, as efficiently as it does. And if it doesn't, then you can then you can actually incorporate that in with your training and let it learn what that looks like. This one is a uh, kind of a half myth as well, and it says only skilled data scientists can do machine learning. I don't necessarily agree with this, but you do really have to know what you're doing if you're trying to roll your own. So one of the restrictions that we had when, uh, when I came into this project, we're not allowed to use cloud. Therefore, Azure, AWS, Google, off, off the table. Our data is so sensitive because we not only have PII that the HIPAA has, we also have something called NPI, which is non-public information, such as your tax records, your bank statements, uh, all this really, really, really sensitive data. So 
Uh, so for us, that was off the table. So we had no choice but to find the best solution for on-premises, uh, which basically meant we had to build our own because there was nothing for on-premises. There was no uh, Azure on-premises at the time. I know we got things like Azure Stack and things, but at the time we started doing this and stuff, that wasn't it wasn't really feasible and it really didn't buy us a lot by doing that. Um, I would say that if you're gonna roll your own, you at least gotta somewhat know what you're doing. You gotta really know the basics. You gotta know the, the type of thing you're trying to solve. You gotta know what your data looks like. You gotta know, uh, you know, basically a starting point, like based, based on that cheat sheet, what type of algorithms you should be looking at. I highly, highly, highly recommend doing this because I will guarantee you that even if you don't understand the math, if you invest some time doing this, you will learn uh, neural networks and machine learning better than you would ever think. Um, and yeah, so basically, uh, yeah, you have to know the basics, even if you're gonna utilize a service. So this is a screenshot taken from the uh, Cognitive Services Custom Vision API. Uh, I wanna say maybe about, this might be about a year or so old now. Uh, so I don't know if it's changed any. But the reason why you have to know the basics, even if you're gonna utilize a service, is basically the way the service works is you can take like a zip file and say these are pictures of zebras, these are pictures of giraffes, drop it in there, it builds and trains a model and learns from it, right? And then what it gives you is not only a service that you can call, but it also gives you this precision and recall graph, right? Kind of going back to like your rock curves that you were showing in your demo. But one of the things with this is it doesn't have a lot of tunable parameters. The only things you can tweak is your data. If your model's not performing good and stuff, you have to either give it more data, take data out, you know, that kind of thing. There's not really a say, oh, you know, it's, you know, it doesn't tell you what the problem is. You basically have to really know your data. And there's nothing that can substitute that. Um, that's why I keep driving that home. Um, yeah. Azure Studio, can, but can you do that in Custom Vision API? That, that's what I'm getting at. Yes. But but I would I would argue too. Well, I I, I guess you would have to I, I think that's kinda conveys the point of like like even doing the, the thing you you were doing, you would either have to look up enough of the the spreadsheets and know and know that you have to split it in the training and like you still have to know the basics and you still have to know what you're doing. Otherwise you're not gonna split in the training and testing sets and then you're not gonna know if your model's correct, right? Um, so I think we were kind of short on time, but uh, if you guys have questions, I'll be around. If you guys have any questions, I'll take them now. But I think we only got a couple of minutes uh, before break. Yeah. Yeah, so the first thing to think about with machine learning and this is where the, the, this was a very big disconnect our business had because they don't realize that machine learning is, a, is at its core a statistical process, right? So if you have something that has defined formulas and like, for example, you're trying to calculate interest, you don't want to be using machine learning for those type of problems. Why? Because you could be wrong when there's an absolute 100% guaranteed way of calculating it. So I would say if there's a situation like that where you have a known solution like a formula, don't even don't even try machine learning, right? Uh, what was the other part of the question? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think that would come out when you normalize, right? Because let, let's say, for example, it's house pricing, right? Well, we know that the value of a house. So basically, what you could do is you could pick an arbitrary range. Let's say, well, the value of a house ranges between zero dollars and a billion dollars. So I basically pick a high and a low value, and then I, when I take a value like a hundred thousand, I have to convert that hundred thousand into a scaled value. It's basically scalar scaling it, or what I call range normalizing. Um, so that would put it in, into that realm. So sometimes you do have to do it. So we have to do that when we do uh, document classification, because. I don't know how many words are gonna be on a document, but I have to guess 
what would make sense, right? So what I do is I pick a number like a thousand or, or two thousand, say, well, there's no more than two thousand dollars, two thousand words on a page. So I normalize my data at that. So I pick values between zero and two thousand, and then then I convert that to a value between zero and one. Does that make sense? I, I could I could probably show you some examples of how that works, but that's basically what you'd have to do is you'd have to convert it from a known range into a into a you know a normalized range. Any other questions? Well, cool. Well, thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it.